It's going to be. There we go. We are we are already in the show as we are talking about whether we're in the show or not. It's like in you Sucha. guys missed the best part. <laughs> I'm telling you, Chris and I were like doing. Go, oh man, we're supposed to be doing a podcast. I was supposed to record this, so yeah. we're actually gonna. He's shaking his head now. No, no, it's true. It's true. We had like the most amazing thing. We actually solved uh, the gun crisis in America. We did. Yeah, we solved that. We solved racism. We solved homophobia. And yet we just forgot to record the entire thing. And um, it, it was really that. good. I just came from a marketing group where I help people with with group questions. Mm -hmm. And one of the things we went to, we went to um, Amazon to search for something. And we're actually looking for, you know, the old light sound machines that you know you put oh, them wow. on okay, yeah. by neural beats so we're that. searching for this and on amazon i'm looking at it go, go a revolver they're selling a revolver it on looks amazon. like a 38 special it looks like a 38 special and the bullets look like bullets except it says that they're pellets and i'm going oh and i thought when they had stuff like that they were supposed to like label it like with orange things that it was yeah. a toy so that people yeah. don't think it's a gun and shoot. Mm -hmm. Well, when I was a kid, they had those water guns that looked like real guns, right? We actually had a couple of them. They were, I forget what they were called, but they were like literally water guns that it looked like a freaking assault rifle or something like that. And then a couple of kids got shot because they, because they were completely black, looked like actually actual military weapons that fired water. And then a couple of cops actually shot some kids because of course they did. <laughs> what the hell? People were crazy. Especially you're in Florida, dude. It's even more crazy. Jeez. Oh, it's 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 crazy going down here. But hey, yeah. that's it. That's why we call it Florida D U H. Florida. It's really, it's really true. I spent seven months in Florida during my Lyme disease. Treatment. I know you were on the other side of the state. Yeah, yeah, and never want to go back. I'm I'm happy to avoid it from here on out. Well, good. Hope, hope you hope you stay away from Florida since you associate it with medical treatment. I do actually associate with, I associate Florida with, I've had some rough times in my life because everybody has, but I would say the seven months I spent in Florida completely alone, uh, racked with Lyme disease. I had to have surgery on my butt while I was there. I had the bipolar stuff without knowing it. Seven months of that was one of the toughest times of my life for sure. So there's a lot of bad associations with Florida basically. Well, also the Floridians and the people that can't, is there a thing in Florida, Harlan, by the way, is there like a law in Florida that you're not allowed to use your turn signals? Is that like in the state constitution or something? Because nobody in Florida uses their turn signals. No, it's called, when you put a signal on, it's called an eventual turn. Sometime <laughs> today, I'm going to make a turn, um, but you have to guess whether it's going to be to the right or the left. Oh, I see. Because when I was there, what I discovered is if you turn your, uh, your turn signal on, people just speed up. Like as soon as you do that, they see it as a challenge and they're like, no, I will not allow you into my lane. And they just That's correct. And even better, there's, the, there is a specific Florida art form to driving in someone's blind spot. Oh yes, exactly. Like yeah. you speed up, they speed up, you slow down to let them go ahead, they slow down and they just stay right in your blind spot. It's, I had that today. It's freaking impressive. It's freaking impressive. Well, dude, it's so good to see you. I actually recorded with Garfinkel yesterday, which was pretty fun. We had a nice little trip through time over the last uh, 15 years. I met you in, what year was it that we first met when you had your value-based copywriting thing way back in the day? 2008? 2000, 2007? Maybe earlier. Yeah, I'm trying to remember because I got into copy when I was 25 or so, I think. And then I did the, again, I always say my biggest mistake in copywriting was taking so long to get into direct response. Because the, the version, because I met you when you had your, your value-based copywriting thing. And I had heard about you for a couple of years before that, because I saw you on the AWAI boards, right? And you were always the guy who was- I got kicked off. Yeah, yeah, I tell you, I kicked off because you were going on there and you were like, Michael Masterson does not exist and kind of just being your general shit disturbing self. And I was like, who is this guy? Who is this obnoxious dude talking about all this stuff? And then I was doing the corporate copywriting thing for a couple of years. So I did like work for like Wells, you know, Washington Mutual Bank and some other things made like 30 grand. And I think I got up to like 70 grand gross doing that. And I was like, I have made it. And then I somehow was on your list. And you had your value-based copywriting thing for whatever that costs. And I was like, 
I have enough money. I'm going to fly to Las Vegas and go to this thing. And no lie, that decision completely changed my life, completely changed my life, changed my career. I don't know where I would be or who I would be at this point um, as far as that goes if I had not kind of taken the plunge. And I remember at the time going to that event and there was that hilarious, what was that bit you like, you called me Christopher at one point, like you were doing like your NLP or something. You were like, and I was like, I feel like my mom is talking to me or something. And we had the binaural beats during that, during that event. And then I was thinking about joining your coaching group, right? And you had the two different tiers. There was the $500 tier and the $1,000 tier of it. And I was like, oh man, I don't know if I can afford it. How is this going to be? But then six months later, I made over a hundred grand and a hundred grand, like just by doing that. And just by, uh, I always say like, you're not the one that taught me how to write, but you're the guy who taught me how to sell myself and actually get paid for what I was writing. And actually like, like you pointed me towards Carlton stuff and Garfinkel and things like that. And that's where I really learned like the art of the copywriting stuff. But what you gave me was the ability to and the confidence to like negotiate with people and get paid what I was worth and actually be like, hey, I'm good at this and have the, the ability to go do it, which was pretty you know, cool. I never really got, in, I'm weird because I respect my mentors. Mm -hmm. And Carlton was teaching copywriting and yeah. Garfinkel was teaching copywriting. And so I made a decision of if they're teaching copywriting, I'm not going into copyright, teaching copyright yeah. out of respect for them. Yep. But they didn't teach how to make money as a copywriter. Not at all. And that's where I went. I made the decision to go in there. And then Carlton got really pissed at me, not for teaching really? that, but right. for teaching but for being so effective that newbies were making right. money so quickly, mm -hmm. he goes, but Harlan, going into restaurants and offering to rewrite their menus was an important part of my thing. I went, sorry, John, <laughs> <laughs> you know, we just skipped right back that. We went straight to direct response letters. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't the only time called and cursed me, but I, it was I, in I, a nice way. It was Did I ever tell you the story about when I knew that Carlton and I were friends? When all of a sudden, because I was like, obviously I was super intimidated by John way back in the day, as we all were. But I was at um, the Sang, Larry Benet's thing, Sang, Speaking Artists Networking Group. Uh, John was there with Kevin Rogers. And at one point I'm walking through the bar and John's sitting down at somewhere and he looks at me and he's like, come here, you schmuck. And he like slapped me kind of gently across the face. And I was like, oh, John Carlton and I are friends because he was mean to me. And suddenly I knew it was, it was fucking awesome. Was oh, there were some, there's some insults of his that I will never forget. Oh yeah, um, like what? Well, my favorite was uh, teaching you how to write copy is like trying to teach a Rottweiler to pee in the backyard. <laughs> That's pretty good. That how did you get into good. how did you get into copy in the first place? What dragged you into this? Because you're you're uh, you you're a doctor of education. You have your background in your NLP stuff. Um, sure. You used to be. So a, used I to opened uh, I opened up a hypnosis studio at, when I was yeah. done from edu with education, and I was it was time to put my NLP and hypnosis skills to work. But I discovered something that out of a hundred hypnotists. 99 are starving. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And generally, if you were to remember phone books, if you were to go through old phone books and call any hypnotist's office more than three years old, chances are the number would be disconnected. They would just not make it. Yeah. Yeah. So I found a service that you did the hypnosis and they did the marketing. And I was like, great. And they yeah. had full page ads. And I would, all you have to do is just place the ad, put in your phone number and the phone is going to ring. Mm -hmm. And it really did. And they said, and we will just keep giving you new ads, new ads and new ads. But they didn't. And I was running ads that worked the first time and maybe the third time. Sure. But when I was time. running the same ads the 10th time, they burned out turned out that there was a guy in the New York uh, branch who um, was running his own ads. And the guy's name is going to be familiar to many of you. His name was Rich Sheffrin. Oh, fuck yeah. yeah. And, and Rich and my friend Jim Van Wick and I uh, met at a conference and everyone else 
was busy going, let me put you into trance. Let me teach you tapping. Let me do this. Let me do that. And I'm sitting there with Rich going, okay, how do you get the clients? What do you do step by step? Mm -hmm. And we were the only ones focused on growing our business. Everybody else was, you will look deeply, you will relax, go all well, the way. Is that similar to like real estate agents or massage therapists who they, yes, don't want, that's it. they don't want, they don't want to sell. They just fundamentally right. don't want to sell. They just want to do the thing. Dan Kennedy was once invited invited to speak at the National Guild of Hypnotists. And he spoke about marketing. Yeah. And he said, and everybody's out in the hall putting one another into trance. And I have the boogie woogie trance and I have this trance. So it's like, it, it's a business that there's such a bunch of helper bunnies that they don't really care about eating or whatever. That's crazy. Well, it's just like NLP is a persuasion thing. Like I use, like I've never like, I, I went through uh, Igor Litikowski's conversational hypnosis thing in Seattle years ago because he was a client of mine. So I did six days of that. It was funny because during that, the other did, Garf the class, did Garfinkel start him off? Um, I'm not really sure, honestly. I don't really remember. I think Garfinkel but, but it's funny, wrote his original letters. I think he might have actually. I think that might be how I got the job actually was through Garfinkel originally. But during it, there were people that were in the group who were like, well, you've been doing this for years, right? I'm like, no, I just, I do marketing. I know how to do this thing. And persuasion is persuasion. But it's interesting how it's a persuasion based thing to kind of help people, but they're so afraid to sell. They're so afraid to like actually ask money for what the valuable thing they can do, which is also where a lot of copywriters were and where I was before I kind of started working with you all those years ago too. So I saw these new letters coming from Sheffrin. Mm -hmm. And I swiped them and adapted them. And then Sheffrin said, hey, I'm going to see Dan Kennedy. I got an extra seat. Want to come? Nice. So I went to Dan Kennedy's last copywriting boot camp. And I was like a pig in mud there. It was like, whoa, the man actually systematically taught how to write. And I was like, whoa, this is great. But I found it incredibly easy. Every other yeah. people were struggling, whatever. And then I met Carlton there. And Carlton, I loved Carlton's presentation. I was like, whoa, this guy is good. What, what was he talking about at that one? It was his standard hooks. hand speech, hooks, yeah. um, be, the, be the only thing in the day that gets their juices running. Mm -hmm. um, what people really want as opposed to what they say they want. Totally. I talk about it a lot. His standard speech, you've probably heard it a half a dozen times. I think I've seen it at least twice. Yeah. And, and then a couple of weeks later, Gary Halbert gave a seminar. And this time I took Sheffrin and it was in Phoenix. Oh. And Gary was on some kind of medication and he wasn't all that coherent oh that's too bad and Carlton got up and did his thing again mm -hmm. so I heard the same thing I heard within the month but the second time it really resonated I went out in the hall and I said I just saw you at Kennedy saw you again here I'd love to join your um program and his mastermind and so forth um and he goes, so why haven't you? I said, the price. He mm -hmm. just looked at me and he went, Harlan, just do it. Stop screwing around. Yeah. So I did it. And um, I, to this day, if you ask John who broke his mentoring program, that would be me. <laughs> because you were, like, you, were, you were a hyper user? Was that it? You were just like, yeah, me. I was way too much. In other words, you had unlimited emails and yep. unlimited critiques and you were very very responsible when, when i when it was uh, when i was in your group you did a similar thing you were super responsible about the whole thing right so i went ahead and um um would write to john in the morning he would write back this really long answer i would redo the whole thing and send it to him that day and yeah. and he would go but i just answered you this morning yeah but it's revised already Okay, so he would make comments and I would, by the next morning, it would be in his email box. I go, Harlan, we have to stop meeting like this. There were times <laughs> I would email him like four or five times a day, but each time completely uh, done. And, you know, I would, each letter would begin with a little bit of an insult. And then, <laughs> that sounds about right. Yeah. Um, and then one day he sent me this 
long missive, doo -doo -doo, which I have framed. Doo -doo. Oh, nice. Let me turn off, let me turn off my blur factor. Oh, yeah, totally, yeah. Doo. There we go. And there we are. It's oh, wow. framed from John Carlton. This is 2004. 2004. So I had been running here from probably a year by then. Mm -hmm. And um, it, this was the famous all clients suck letter that he later reprinted in the collected letters. If you go through the collected letters of John Colton, half the letters were to me. Is that, is that on Amazon or is that a book you put on Amazon or is that something else that he did? I think letter. that's something else. I think you can only get it from um, marketingrebel.com. Uh, sure. Yeah. But down at the bottom, it was Harlan, you're learning and you're in the middle of your learning period. Don't try to shortcut it. Enjoy it. You're one of the brethren of the pen now. When I got that letter, you are brethren of the pen. I was That's like, great. whoa, John thinks I'm 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 a copywriter. It was like yeah, that was it. it was like, yeah. OK, I'm that was and and then we became we became friends um i was like you know astounded um whenever i gave a seminar invited him he yep. showed up he came to it was you know it, it was a a pivotal thing uh meeting john and um we became friends you know I'll call him up how you doing and Whatever it's weird. It's weird when your heroes become your peers, right? It's such an interesting thing. I remember when David, the first time David Deutsch called me for advice on a, something he was working on, I was like, "Oh my God, what has happened in my life?" Because he was working on some offer that he needed a little more help, kind of figuring out the emotional aspects of things or whatever. And he called me up, and it was like it was crazy to me. It was like this guy who I had had this incredible work crush on and saw as this giant of the industry. And then we're just hanging out and chatting, going to the bar, hanging out with Paris on Propolis. He's a good friend of mine at this point. It's such a strange, like seeing these people that you saw on the, on the mountain and now they're just right there with you. It was a fascinating experience yeah, to go through. I, and I have gotten advice calls from all of these folk. Mm -hmm. um, Paris most recently, David a bunch of times, David yep. Garfinkel a bunch of times. Yep. Um, but they're good people, but these people, you know, they have their own level of genius. Mm -hmm. And it's beyond anything that people can imagine. And one of the things, since we're wandering around here, is we, we, we will wander wherever we go. But, well, well, yeah. this is something that I've seen you write about, mm -hmm. and that is the people who start copywriting do it for two weeks and then they start mentoring people yes that is a thing i have a real problem with yeah well i have a real problem because these people i had somebody you know who attended value-based copywriting where he learned nlp oh did he steal um, it hmm? did he steal it from you and try to sell it as his own thing or what well actually at value-based copywriting someone goes harlan are you going to sell the um, recordings sure and um i went oh and i went to go buy the domain value-based copywriting and i found it was taken and i looked up and it was this guy sitting in my seminar he bought it during my seminar and i went to him and i went i really can't believe you bought the name of my seminar during my seminar Mm -hmm. And he goes, no, I thought of the name separately. And I said, seriously? What is you the name of the seminar? You value-based copywriting seminar, and you independently thought of value-based copywriting? Well, he goes, you want the domain name? I go, no, I just want to know who you are. That's all. Yeah. Yeah. So this guy shows up now. He was probably a second or third stream copywriter and he's doing mentoring now and i'm like okay oh man he he, yeah. re he recently corrected my nlp in a group and told me i didn't know what i was talking about so we parted ways yeah well, holy crap dude that's crazy um so you know it's been a heck of a journey i mean 
the people that I got to meet and write for, like a who's who of. You worked with Kern, you worked with all sorts of crazy people. Yeah. I started with Stephen Pierce, and Stephen Pierce had a blog program. Really quickly, for people that are listening, if we say names you don't recognize, you should go look them up because these are people that have done some real, real interesting things in our business. So, and, yeah. and so, so he had a blog program. This was before anybody really knew blogging. And his brother was a blog expert. Um, and the headline that I wrote was, Stephen, if you don't tell your brother to shut the blank up, he's a dead man. <laughs> Good one. And um, the thing sold like crazy. It, it was insane. So Stephen Pierce calls me one day and he goes, was that headline really true? I said, well, it could be. And he just started laughing. So I'm at a bar at an event and this guy goes, man, that headline you wrote for Pierce was like the best headline I ever saw. And he goes, do you write for other people? And I said, yeah, Frank, I'll write for you. And that started my adventures with Frank Kern. Now around the time, um, John Reese had just done Traffic Secrets Taught Live. Was that his first, and, was that the first million dollar day? Was, I mean, I know Reese oh, this was before the day. This was okay. the seminar. And yeah. then the million dollar day was selling the recordings. Oh, man, incredible. So, um, and the letter was put together by Michael Fortin. Yep. And the bullets were written by a guy nobody has ever heard his name. Um, oh, wow. And he was a local copywriter who flew under the cover, and he did all of the bullets for that letter. Fortin wrote around it. This guy wrote the bullets and they put it together. And that became the million dollar, the famous million dollar day. Mm -hmm. And then Kern got jealous because he and Reese were buddies. Yep. And he said, well, I want to beat him. So the, um, the first thing that he did was we did this ser serializer mm -hmm. uh, seminar. Yep. And he sold 66 seat one time he sold 66 seats the other time he sold the, the bounds i think the first time he sh he sold 44 seats and then next time 56 yeah. seats yeah. so he could make a million dollars but that was yeah. but reese said yeah but it took you two times to do it yeah yeah so then he contacted me and this was when um neil strauss had come out with the book the game and frank's uh, cousin Trey said yep. this would be a great product so they had no product they had no recordings and Frank goes this is the biggest thing go out and get the book so I went out and got the book and I read it because you have no idea how big this is I went, okay and he said but we have nothing so I said all right so what you do is you get the guy in front of a small audience you record it and um, and then you make DVDs and you sell the DVDs. Yep. And he said, but that's gonna cost us a fortune to get it in, a room <laughs> set up, whatever. I went, Frank, you charge the people to be there. Yeah. He went, really? I went, yeah. Well, I read the book, people would kill to be in the room with him. Yep, yep. He said, what do you think people would pay? I said, 4,000, 5,000, 6,000. He said, you're insane. I said, well, maybe I am, but why don't you test it? They had people bidding seven, $8,000 to sit in there. They made money before they even started. That they book started was at a profit. And then I wrote the letter. And man, I had so much fun with that letter. I had so much fun with Writing that. Writing pickup letter. stuff is fun, man, yeah. And um, I wrote the letter and then um, Frank did all of the emails. Mm -hmm. And the Frank's emails- Frank's always been amazing at emails, yeah. 
the emails I remember, and, and Neil Strauss was then like still wrote for like the New York Times and he was mm -hmm. so, and Frank's going, man, this has to be straight. Neil will not accept if it's not straight. Um, I said, okay. But then Frank wrote these emails that were insane. Um, he wrote it as if he was Neil Strauss, yeah. the black mirror technique. I remember that one. I remember that one. That, that was yeah. like probably one of the best emails in yeah, history. Yeah. It was crazy. I mean, that Neil went to someplace in Europe and he did the black mirror technique yeah. and yeah. women just started taking off their clothes in front I think of you him. Had, I think you had us reading that when like in your group all those years ago. You, like, you right. it, was, it was just such a, it was yeah. such a great email and the annihilation method letter, which was about three or four thousand dollars or something like that so, yeah. mm -hmm. and it sold out in 20 minutes made 1.2 million and then kern was done with the project he beat reese in an it. hour a little over an hour and instead of 24 hours and he was done he was done with that niche never went back into it etc so there, there, there are a lot of war stories like that oh, yeah. um Sheffrin's, uh first launch and I wrote the letter and I'm done with the letter. It is 29 pages. It is two o'clock in the morning. I've just sent the final thing. The phone rings. It's Rich Sheffrin. Yeah. It goes, John's on the line. Okay. And Mike Phil Same is on the line. There are like a half a dozen people on the line. Um, and I'm going, all, all okay. the syndicate people, it sounds like. Yeah, back in the day. Like, okay. Um, why are we all on the line at two in the morning? John goes, the letter's too long. Okay. I, went, I thought I would never hear those words. I've from never him. heard anybody say that who knows what, I mean, you, you can be too long if it's boring or has a lot of extra. extra it wasn't in. boring. Yeah. So I said, half the letter are testimonials from people that, you know, it, and I've never had testimonials like this. Yeah. John goes, you have nine pages, including testimonials, not an additional page. Okay. I went, well, thanks. It's two o'clock in the morning. I have to rewrite the letter, amputate and whatever. John goes, better get to work. <laughs> so, so I do the, the letter. I finish like five in the morning, go home, fall asleep. By the time I woke up and went over to Sheffron's house, he was a multimillionaire. So, um, yeah, there have been plenty of stories like that. And you get to meet lots of interesting people. And when you're the copywriter, you learn all kinds of stuff. You get access to stuff that other people don't get. Yeah. Writing for Jay Abraham, I ended up getting like the whole Jay Abraham a library, yeah, but, sense. More, but even more so getting to work with Jay and having him go over the copy. Jay doesn't write much copy anymore. He probably hasn't written copy in, in, in forever, but when he looks at copy and makes suggestions on the copy, they're really good. I mean, yeah. Well, all that experience, like I was on with my coaching group today, a couple of people have in that, and I'm just like, I'm just spitballing, right? I'm like, oh, this bullet should be this instead, this bullet should be this instead. And that Megan, who's in my group, was like, we're recording this, right? I'm like, yeah, we're recording it. Just take what I tell you and do it. When you do it long enough and you've been in the trenches like you and I have for over decades at this point, like it just kind of gets seeped into your brain at a certain point because you have so much experience and so many, so many times going to the wall with it. Well, one of the things also that has occurred to me is that I can pretty much read a letter now mm -hmm. and tell you who really yep. wrote the letter. You've picked okay, out some minds over you've picked out some mine over the years. Yeah. Right. And like, oh, this is a dad letter. Yep. Um, the um, who else would write a letter about diabetes that start with someone getting his, his leg amputated? Okay. Yeah, totally. Only <laughs> one person I know would do that. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> okay. Um, so yeah, but there's a tone and there's a pace and there are patterns. And rhythm, rhythms too, a lot of rhythms. That's least, correct. My, my stuff is very, very rhythmic, really. It's got that kind of, that kind of the beats to it all there. And, on and place. I, I said 
um, once had this discussion with John about that good copy has a rhythm, has a beat, mm -hmm. um, and you can identify the copywriter by the beat. Mm -hmm. You can tell who they are and, you know, whatever. But, but the, the, this actually speaks a little bit to something I, I want to talk about, which is individuality as a copywriter, right? So you were talking before about all these punk kids who are like 25 years old and never really got anywhere. And now they're teaching copy and they're a copy guru now despite having no background in it whatsoever. But there's also a lot of people who are, you know, they think that copywriting means you copy people, right? They think that copywriting mean, like, means like, okay, take Chris's letter and just do the, like change every fifth word. And then that's kind of your thing or that. And I'm always like, listen, if you want to get pretty good, then go ahead. Like, you know, try to be somebody else. If you want to get great, if you want to get to like that top tier, you got to be yourself. You have to develop your own style, your own rhythms, your own attitude, your own ideas and all that kind of stuff, as opposed to just trying to be another also ran or trying to, uh, you know, a lot of the kids these days, they really seem to want to skip right from I'm new to why I'm making 25 grand or 30 grand a letter and not actually right. get. And, and some of the people are getting the letter um, and getting the price and not able to deliver. And it's really giving um, copywriters a bad name. It really is. They're I was talking to um, good friends of mine, actually, people I've worked with in the past, but they, they don't, I'm just not doing those kind of deals anymore. And they're like, oh, I hired three people who charged me 10 grand each and all of their letters bombed. And even worse, when I went back and said, hey, this sucks, can you fix it? They said, no. They were like, I gave you the letter, that's it. And I'm like, what is, like when I was coming, if, if I had come to you when I was your, your cub way back in the day and said, hey, this client wants me to rewrite this, but I'm not gonna do it. You would have ripped me a new asshole. And for good what are you, out of your mind? And then I would have said, okay, let's get the letter up and let's rewrite it together. Absolutely, yeah. Which, which you know, whatever, I've had Mike Morgan wrote a sales letter, it was the night of a launch, yep. the sales letter, bombed mm -hmm. and we looked at the letter i think we redid the first page they relaunched it and that's how it became million dollar mike morgan million dollar mike morgan yeah totally that was i remember sitting at the sterling valentine launch um oh yeah and this is a, these are long way back but in other words when when someone gives you money to write a letter yep um your job is to make that guy as much money as possible. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. if you don't, you redo the letter. Typically, I find that it's the headline and the lead that are the problem. And you don't that's have- the That's the highest leverage area for any letter you're working on. Right. And then if you change the headline and the lead, nine times out of 10, you've solved the problem. I think mm -hmm. in my career, I have only had to redo letters from scratch, maybe once or twice. I have one of my own letters I wrote years ago that I, I, I didn't change the offer at all. I just rewrote the lead uh, while I was at, um, I think it was uh, Underground 5 or something like that. I rewrote the lead and literally quadrupled conversions just by changing the first two pages. Like yeah. quadrupled. So, yeah. um, so folks, if you're out there and, and you're watching this, Jay Abraham has a strategy. It's called the strategy of preeminence, which means if you are my client, then I owe everything to do the absolute best for you. Now, yeah. let me tell you, when you write a letter that is a killer letter for someone, they're going to tell their friends. Everybody, everybody. If you write a letter that bombs they're going to tell even more friends about it. And if you write a letter that bombs and you've charged them way too much money for it, they're going to tell all their friends and no one will even give you another chance because you're too expensive for your level of skill. And that's not a good place to be. No. And good, fast, I, good, fast or cheap, pick two. But if you're not good, you better be cheaper. I see people writing all the time of like, my letter bombed. I don't really know much about the topic. And just this morning, someone um ask me if i would do a letter for them and it's about a niche i'm peripherally familiar with sure and i started reading his he started with a pitch deck and the mm. pitch deck i couldn't make it through half a page because he gave a long metaphor to start and i said ceos don't want a long metaphor 
for. You need to get to the point in like a sentence or two, or yep. they're going to just put it down. They're, you know, this is not your captive audience. Well, I remember Carlton's feedback oftentimes was just cut the first two pages. You're wasting my time. A lot of times was just like, you're clearing your throat. You're getting into it. Like cut that crap out and get into the actual meat, get into the message, get into what's unique about your shit. Instead of just writing, don't waste people's time. Yeah. So I want to talk with you with two topics that will be beneficial to it. your audience. Let's do Topic it. number one, and I think you're still working on a product around this, which was the launch yeah. of yeah. Pig. Yeah. The launch of Pig. This which is gonna was, be a, this is gonna be a damn good product, actually. I, I finally got it. It's a, it was weirdly complicated to figure out how to teach what I wanted to teach, but it's gonna be really, really good uh, in a but few months. That um if you don't have somebody going through the group and pulling out your posts and videos and stuff like mm -hmm. that, including that in the product, mm -hmm. um, you're missing out. But there was a tension that was created in the group mm -hmm. almost from the beginning, yeah. where it was framed as like, um, there's us versus them as Kern likes to teach. Yeah. Um, but you framed it as like, the winners and losers, yep. uh, pretty much. And the winners were going to be the people using your method because after all, you were a winner. And then there were going to be the others and they were never going to have access to it. Mm -hmm. And it was really, really amazing how like an almost like a school teacher, you got everybody to line up in rows and wait their turn patiently. And they were so excited. And, and every time you put something in, they went to further heights of like, I can't wait. And they were hyping each other. That's the cool, like, well, I actually, I went through all my posts. I, I have a, um, the first video in the Film of Formula product is gonna be me just going through the entire launch from like conception all the way through and going through the post. But it's amazing because I didn't, I only did like maybe two or three posts a day, but then everyone else like got on board. Right, like they got on board and they helped me sell it, and they felt like they. I'm, I'm going to teach this in the course. It's like you want them to feel like they're on your team. You want people to want you to succeed. You want people to feel like they are also that your success is their success, even though they're giving you money at the end of the day. And then I remember it was like Thanksgiving week, and I yeah. came up with an idea that pissed you off at first. Yeah, you went. I don't even know if that's possible. Yeah, because we I didn't know if we had it. I don't know if we had the cart ready basically that day to be able to do it. Yeah, right. And then you like got back to me and goes, okay, we can do it. And basically mm -hmm. the idea was to let a few people in by not giving them the product, selling them the product, allowing them to purchase. And that they, the only reason they were doing was a condition that they go through the product and come back and tell people whether it was worth it. And then all of a sudden- give, give, give an honest review. That's what I said. Don't, don't, don't blow smoke, don't whatever else. Don't, don't send it to me and I'll, I'll decide if it goes up or not. Put it in the group, give an honest review. Let's go and see what happens. Yeah. And it, it made them to like a fever, fever pitch. Mm -hmm. and, and those 12 people, those 12 people who became my 12 hedonic apostles, they 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 felt even more like again going back to the the, the in group out group behavior etc. Like you'll notice throughout the that entire launch right. So first I was just doing it on my personal Facebook. Then I create the group and then I'm teasing people who aren't in the group. Why aren't you in the group? Right. That's the whole thing. What's wrong with you? Something's going on in the group. Then in the group, the next version was oh you better get on the early bird list. That's where the even more special people are. You have to get into that one. And then you're part of the special group that's over there. And then with the twelve hedonic apostles it was the same thing. Now they're the special ones. And there's just constantly just like oh but those are the cooler people those are the cooler people those are the cooler people and creating this incredible like those 12 people became my lieutenants they sold like quite honestly they they told people to buy it people came to them and said hey is it actually that good or not and they helped me sell a lot more units that way and and they're still talking about it i mean yep. um one one of the 12 apostles interestingly was a rabbi rabbi yeah. andy Andrew. and yeah. um and she to this day raves about the product, raves about PIG, mm -hmm. and um, is just like, we got to get more people to buy it. We got to get more people to buy it. Yeah, because and she's, she's actually helping me sell it right now. She's going to be taking doing some sales calls for me starting next week. So it's exciting. Well, she and and she's doing it as someone who really believes in it. Correct. Correct. 
And that's, so, that's actually the coolest part. Like the reason I want people who have been students of mine to, to help sell it is because you can only, this is the thing too, right? You can only pull something off, like having 12 people go in a week early if your stuff is actually good, right? Because otherwise- oh, well, well, there you go, there you go. Yeah. I mean, I don't know about you, but the I have pretty much stopped buying products or copy products because they suck. Well, there's, reg there's regurgitated stuff from like Con Hopkins from a hundred years ago, whatever, which is cool, but you need your own spin on it. You need something that's a little different. I'm not even that. seeing that anymore. No, I'm not even seeing that anymore. And there's also a school of copywriting that says, if you post jibber jabber in enough Facebook groups that yeah. try then shows you as intelligent, then people are going to want to hire you. Yeah. And someone sent me one of these this week in a Facebook messenger. And I was like, and so, oh, I just wanted to show you this because I posted it on LinkedIn. I went, okay, were you trying to use this to get clients? Because as a method of getting clients, I think it sucks. Yeah, it's awful. And um, they just like, put their tail between their legs. And I went, dude, I'm trying to help you. And you got well, your I, I tell people, I'm like, you sent me this message and you're saying you're a copywriter, but this is not selling you very well, right? If you can't sell yourself, I don't trust you to sell anything else either at the end of the day. So um, I have, you know, seen it all done. I'm looking at shells over here and mm -hmm. there are copywriters out there who are great copywriter, copywriters who fly entirely under the radar oh absolutely the, yeah the most successful dan kennedy student yep beats the pants off of dan kennedy in copywriting and half wow. the people if you mention his name a couple of people go oh yeah you know yep. whatever and and for those of you who want to know um uh tj roliter tj roliter is a direct wow. male copywriter has his in, in he is so big that this guy has his own print shop and factory oh um God. doing mass mailings wow the guy makes money head over it's just he's a money machine it, mm -hmm. he has a license to print money mm -hmm. um, incidentally if you poke around the internet he does this really weird thing where he gives away all of his books. So, oh wow, TJ Roliter. Let me spell it for you. So that yeah, please do. I it. want to check it out. If you type in TJ Roliter, you'll find it. But mm -hmm. uh, here's one. He calls himself America's Blue Jeans Millionaire. He has a bunch of books, and it's TJ initial T initial J Roliter. R-O-H-L-E-D-E-R. -E -E and if you go to some of the, so his, his, one of his books is um, Ruthless Copywriting Strategies. Mm. Or here's another one on copywriting as a seminar, How to Make Millions Sitting on Your Ass. <laughs> Good name. Um, That's like Jeff Paul back in the day, make millions in your underwear. You know? Right. And I wrote for Jeff too. Didn't you? I wrote, for Jeff. I, wrote, I wrote quite a bit of things. He, he was the first guy to give me 10,000 bucks for a letter. Like he was the, he hired me to do, I met him at, uh, actually we'll talk about Big Seminar 5. I'm sure, not, I, not Big Seminar Summer 5, uh, Armin Morin's thing. Right, uh, that was yeah. Big Seminar. Yeah. yeah, was that Big Seminar? Oh, it was, I'm sorry, thinking I'm getting Big Seminar and Underground kind of uh, messed up. But I met, um, I met Larry Benet at uh, Big Seminar 5. And then Larry introduced me to Jeff Paul. And then Jeff Paul was a client of mine in the gym, his uh, partner gym for like two Jim or three Flag. years after that. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, there are copywriters out there that people haven't heard of that are just raking in the millions and they're not on Facebook posing about how great they are. They're, mm. they're too busy making money. There are well, a I tell lot people of too, people. It's like, I, when I, you know, I came back, I came in and started teaching in the last year or so really, but like, I always tell people, I'm like, you want to learn how to do this? Learn from somebody that's actually done it and isn't just like circle jerking, teaching copywriting stuff their entire career. Like you want people that have, like, I've gone out into the relationship niche. I've worked in all these other kind of niches and done it. And it bothers me that there's so many people who are falling for these like guys who have, they've never even had a million dollar letter. They've never, they freelanced for, like you said, for two weeks and then decided they were gurus or something. Like they're just wasting people's time and giving them crappy advice more than anything.
So it, it concerns me because I see that the direction, I don't think there's anything stopping this there. And you know, it's really sad. And also some of the better copywriters, they don't market themselves. Not at all. They're they so scared to, yeah. Well, some one of the best copywriters, unfortunately, passed away. Didn't market himself well himself well at all. Was Scott mm -hmm. Haynes? He was a yeah. great copywriter, yeah. mm -hmm. um, but he didn't market himself. You know, he was used to Gary feeding him clients, or yep. maybe John fed him some clients too. But um, when he wrote, you know, he, he's he's passed away now, but. Um, one of Scott's great letters was the infamous now Trump University letter. That, was, uh, <laughs> that, that, that led was, to some pretty big lawsuits. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. That was the, that was the Scott Haynes letter. Go sue Scott mm -hmm. now if you can find him. Um, yeah. But, um, you know, there are people like that who are just unsung below the radar. So I, first of all, number one, if you're hiring a copywriter, it's a big decision, especially if they're going to ask you for ten, fifteen thousand dollars or more. Some of these guys open up their door and it's like, okay, it'll be twenty five thousand dollars plus your firstborn child as royalties. And by the way, um, I have no experience. <laughs> like whatever. No, there's different guys. Yeah. And, and you say, okay, let me see what you've done. Well, I assisted on this letter. Okay, you know what? Give me the names of your last five clients. Yeah. And their phone number, so I can ask them about you. Nothing. 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 Yeah. Don't don't be fooled Humble. by this by this stuff, God, folks. You I feel know, like one thing I'm, I need to, we need to do. I mean, and again, I I have entrepreneurs who buy my stuff too, and half the time, I'm just like guys, even if you don't intend to be a copywriter yourself, you need to know enough copy to be able to hire a good copywriter. You can't just like look at the stuff and have no idea what you're doing and expect to actually get good work from people. You have to understand the psychology of it and enough that you can even see if somebody gives you something good or not in the first place. Or, you know, or the people who are um, spamming people on chat and all they don't the really know what they're doing. Yeah, all the time. Do you ever hire copywriters? Yes. Then a week later and go, how do you decide who to hire? Time goes by. Are you looking for a copywriter now? And I'm going, are you really using doing this? Answering like once a week, trying to get a client? Do you know what but also, but also not even selling themselves at all, right? Like this right. is the thing too. Like, so let's let's talk about the big seminar five thing for a minute, because I think it's an interesting because because that was like the first thing back in the day. I joined your group. And you were like, and we went, we did the one way spikes of doom thing, which is the whole thing, my, my original kind of copywriting letter. And then you said, go to Big Seminar Five, bring your business cards, just go. And you walked story. around like a mad person. I did. Giving every single person there your business cards. No, no, I put, I listened to you. I, you, I think, you put I think them you out everywhere. I listened to you and you said, put one on every seat in the room. And I'm like, cool. And Armin I did. Warren didn't like that very much. But I got clients out of it. Yeah, I got oh, man, sorry, Armin. Yeah, um, ask for ask for forgiveness, not for permission, folks. You know, at the end of the day. Well, um, yeah, Carlton told me that once, so um, <laughs> I, I did that. And you know, if you are a um, copywriting student and you want to get clients, there are a couple of really big seminars that you should go to, especially when they're live, and you got to go there live. Now, yeah. Don't tell anybody. Okay, with the pandemic, yes. that wasn't really doable for, for years and all that kind of stuff. But but you got to go and where you go, you don't even have to pay for the seminar. If you can't afford the seminar, you go and you get there the night before and you go to the bar and you right. hang out and you stay at the bar until they close up. And I don't you practice whatever you need to do. If you are an introvert, you yep. practice going up to people and saying hello and saying, hi, I'm Harlan, I'm a copywriter, who are you? Mm -hmm. And nobody's going to say, get away from me. They're gonna sit down and talk to you. I, I always so say going to business conferences is kind of like going to a sex party. Everybody is there for the same reason, right? right. Like, you're, like if you go flirt with a girl at a sex party or something, you're not gonna get slapped because that's what that's the deal. It's the same thing as a copywriting thing or not, another seminar, everybody is there for the same reason. It's easy to walk up to somebody and say, hey, what's your business? What do you do? What I always tell do? people too, don't go looking for clients, go looking for relationships, yes. right? 
which is well, the number I always one said go looking for clients, but it starts with relationships. No, totally. But don't, but like, don't go and like, yeah, I know other copywriters who go and they say, they meet someone's like, hi, I'm a copywriter. Do you have any work for a copywriter? I'm like, don't do that. It's like asking a girl to go to bed with you before you've done, before you even told her your name, right? You need right. to actually develop that relationship that is, first. Uh, what happens is when people do that and they go to these things and they are friendly and you go back the next night, yep. but I'll tell you that the night at the bar on the last day of the seminar, the pickings are going to be slimmer because a lot of people leave seminars early, but the ones yeah. who remain behind are more serious because they didn't find what they wanted. That's true. And so your job is to go to the bar. Um, and, and that is- and If you don't drink, get a Sprite and just hold it all night or get a club soda or whatever but be at the bar. Like that's, that, that's the number one thing I ever learned back then. And so if you're going to like, you know, uh, things to attend uh, is traffic and conversion yep. would be the big one now. And that's the next big one would be yeah. click, click funnels. Yep. And, and I think, and I think Yannick is bringing back underground. Did I see something about that? I don't know. I spoke at underground five or six years ago when he had kind of sold it or given it over to Dush and his partner, I think. Uh, and I'm not, I, that was the last time I even heard of them doing it. I don't really remember. I thought I saw something that it might have been coming back, but yeah. I'm old. Well, that'd, that'd be cool. I'd love, to, I'd love to go and check it out again. Big, I mean, Underground 5 remains to this day my favorite conference I've ever been to. I made friends at Underground 5 that I still have to this day. I ran one of my launches from that seminar, which was actually kind of fun that went really, really well. And it's just like, that is like the, the, the golden, um, the golden era of like the version of like any of those things I've ever been to my entire life. I also got a lot just, of clients out of it. Just understand that when someone meets you live and not via email and not via Zoom, yeah. you become a real person and they are less afraid to hire you because as Chris is talking, you have the relationship with them. Yep. Now, when you're a copywriter, if you spend all of your time studying copy and you don't spend at least 50 to 60 to 70% of the time studying marketing, you are getting bad advice. Yeah. See, your clients don't know how to market. Nope. And when you become their one person copywriter, marketing coach, whatever, that person is your client for life. Well, that's, I see people now doing, uh, they're kind of repositioning themselves, not as copywriters, but as um, fractional CMO is the buzzword for this thing kind of right now. Somebody I know, I forget his name right now, wrote a book about this doing really well, but then Josh Rosenberg is doing a similar thing where like, oh, I'm not a copywriter, I'm your fractional CMO is gonna help you figure out your ideas and shit like that. I think the issue sometimes is like, I'm like, for me, I, I it's always to tell clients, I'm like, why didn't you call me before you figured out the name of the product instead of doing, instead of calling me when the product's already done, and I need to write a sales letter for it. Cause like product concept to me is copy that the name of the product to me is copy. All of it is really even right. So it's always confusing to me when people go off who don't understand marketing, create a product, name the product about like, you know, the, used to use this example, the amazing djembe drum program that you think you're gonna make a million dollars off of. And then they try to fi find a copywriter who's like, that's a really crappy product idea. That's not gonna work for you. Why are you doing that? Yeah, well, it reminds me of the lady who came to me in a Jim, uh, Jay Abraham seminar and wanted me to do a sales letter for her for online xylophone music. And I, those were the days I used, what was it, Word Tracker to check the number of keywords. Oh, so sure, yeah. I log, logged into my account and I saw that there had been two searches in the previous month. And I was reasonably sure that she was both of them. Um, <laughs> and, and I just said, no, I won't do it. And she said, why? I said, because nobody's looking to buy this. And she said, yeah. that's because my, my product isn't up there. When my product is up there, people will come and buy it. And, um, and I just feel the dreams, I uh, feel the dreams that's, angle on that's, that that's one. Not, that's not gonna happen. That's not gonna happen. That's, that's like the old, you know, money can't buy you happiness. I mean, no, what is it? Um, uh, do what you love and the money will follow, right? I right. Think our, I talked about this the other day, but it's like, yeah, do what you love. And if what you love is able to make money, the money will follow. But if what you love is teaching xylophone music when nobody wants to learn that, you're just gonna stay broke. Like plain and simple. So, 
you said something earlier and it I, I put things together over the years yeah and I talked about this on Garf's podcast which is supposed to air about now so I don't want to mm -hmm. repeat myself in case any of you people uh, listen to both so I don't want to duplicate myself but I do want to talk about this new thing that I've come up with called the interactive sales letter Oh yeah, yeah. I saw that on uh, suppose some posts about that on you yeah, on Facebook. And an interactive sales letter is, you know, like probably one of the most successful funnels in the world is the V shred letter. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you really push through the letter, and as you go through the funnel, and they're making a ton of money. They are. Um, those guys, by the way, told me when I spoke at Copy Accelerator, they, gave, they, they got up after I gave my speech and said, hey, Chris, we stumbled onto a video of yours on YouTube six years ago, and that's what convinced us that we could do this. And that's when they started their entire business, to which I said, where's my check? But hey, right. Yeah. So um, the thing is that as you go through the funnel and you get to your personalized video, it's the same video everybody's seeing, like maybe yeah. for it's different for a man, for a woman, like this is the man video, this is the woman video. Um, but an interactive sales letter asks people questions. And when you answer the question, it takes them to that specific piece. Yeah. So if someone comes to you and you say, what's your biggest problem in marketing? And yep. the first thing is, I don't have a product. They go to a video and say, oh, okay, so you don't have a product. Well, you know, finding a product isn't as hard as you think. Here mm -hmm. are some ways to whatever. And if they say, problem is I have, you know, I have a product, I just don't have a sales letter. Okay, yep. you've got a product, here are some hints to, and so it's worked incredibly well for me. Mm -hmm. And I have videos where, as you go through the videos, there, there are incredible analytics and you see a hundred percent completion on the videos. Holy crap. That's and amazing. most, um, and most of the, uh, letters not only to complete but they also go on to buy it record numbers yeah. so, so when that, in that, in that version, yeah, how is how does that mechanically work right i've seen that kind of thing in like google doc letters that people have been doing for a little while there's, here. there's all oh, kinds yeah. of software does it i happen to like um there's a, there are a lot of videos that say that they can do it but they really can't yeah my favorite is called mindstamp.io and by the way Tyler, who is their um, marketing coaching guy, uh, will do a free session with you and show you how the software works. Just tell him Harlan sent you yeah. uh, and he'll smile. Um, but, but it's a pretty amazing piece of software, but then there's the logic of doing it. Yeah. So um, I recently spoke to a major marketer who has an $80 million a year business. And his mm -hmm. business has been YouTube to video, YouTube to video, yeah. spends a fortune on YouTube. Um, and there was, and this was his control. And he, we know one another, we're friendly and he reached out and I told him what to do. And about two weeks ago, he told me three weeks ago, he told me it was done. Two weeks ago, I said, how did it do? And he said, it blew past every control they had. That's fucking awesome. Yeah. So I think that this is the future. The funny thing is um, that everybody would rather duplicate the, oh no, it's the hospital siren. Oh, I don't, know, die. I know. don't die. Please don't die. Don't die. I'll never every forgive single, myself. Every single freaking health letter on ClickBank, every single freaking one, no matter what, it could be for toe, toenail fungus, and it will open up with somebody in the hospital about to die. They're going to have to amputate his toe. No, yeah. no, don't take my toe. I need Not my, my toe. son. No. Yeah, all that stuff. And then he woke up and it was a dream. Mm -hmm. oh, 
It was, and, and, and they're all doing it and they think it's original. And what all they're doing is rapidly turning that into something that just won't work. It, it's, well, it was like back in the day, there was the warning, this video is controversial. Like everybody in the, uh, the pickup niche was doing that. Warning, this video is controversial and angry feminists don't want you to see it. And that was literally every, the intro to every single letter in that niche for a few months until it just stopped working entirely because it was everybody was doing these. So things. those letters are going to stop working. Yep. But in an interactive video, you're, first of all, you better know the damn niche. Yeah. Second, you need to know the pain points of the niche and get people involved in the interactivity at the beginning and let them see that it really is unique. Yep. And that if you ask them a question, you're giving them a specific answer. That's different. Mm -hmm. and, and so it's it's like a quiz funnel on steroids and you can have you seen like, blair blair gorman's uh numerology letter where it's got like, oh, sure. you know, like extremely customized kind of thing that he's, he's yeah, built up absolutely the that was that was yeah. those are the things you know back in the day you had reese doing his was it wasn't when it, it was um um, it was the br bridal shower secrets. That was John Reese's thing. Mm, interesting. Okay. And you came to a page where you filled out, filled out all kinds of information. What is the bride's name? What is your relationship to the bride? What's the groom's name? All, all kinds of questions about the wedding, whatever. And then you click submit. And it was a PHP script that wrote the letter that said, um, Lori, um, your niece Annie will be so happy when she has the bridal shower of her dreams. Wow. And, you know, you can imagine her calling her fiance John, and everything just went right into the, and it sold like the Dickens. See, now, Harlan, I'm going to have to do one of these for one of my things and see how it does on YouTube. I'm just going to have to write this over the weekend. Like, sheesh, I have stuff, other stuff to do. What are you doing? My God. Um, let's talk about, you know, having been in this business for a long I did this with Garfinkel a little bit yesterday, too. I've been in this business for a long time and being a quote unquote famous copywriter at this point, quote unquote. Sometimes people are like, well, Chris, you've always been successful. You've always been these kind of things. Can you just explain a little bit what I was like when you first met me all those years ago? Okay, so it's a long time ago. And one of the first steps that we had was making sure that people had their own website. Yeah. You know, people don't even do that anymore. Fucking crazy. Um, they don't have websites. I remember back in the day, we were doing Google PPC to our websites, and I made a fortune off of that. Mm -hmm. And you would type in direct mail copywriter or direct response copywriter, and there yep. would be two pages of copywriters there, yep. uh, of, of lists of copywriters. I think if you did that today, you wouldn't even find one. Yep. Um, it's just nobody's doing it. Um, and so we were working on your letter, and you came up with the um, the spikes of doom. The one-way spikes of doom, which I got because I was being driven to the airport by somebody else was at value-based copywriting. And we went over some of those spikes that you have where they won't let you back out of a uh, parking garage or something like that. And I'm like, that's a cool idea. So I use that as a hook for the entire thing. And I remember the number of times that you had to, or being a hard ass, yeah. had you rewrite it. But yep. the thing was, you had this incredible sense of drive that no matter what I threw at you, you knew that I meant it for good yep. and that you were going to come back and make it better. And you took everything that I threw at you and you turned out that killer thing. Yep. And then when value-based copy came out and you learned that you could price yourself, that was crazy. There was a guy there at value-based copywriting who had, who had been a copywriter in only one niche. Mm. And 
he had and he wanted to leave that niche because he was in that niche but he was good at copy yeah he went to value-based copywriting i called him up two weeks later and he said harlan thanks for value-based copywriting i said what's going on he said sold my first sales letter i went yeah sounds like you want to say something more he goes i got 80 grand for it Ooh. this was this was what, like 2005, 2006? Somewhere, somewhere around there, yeah. And he was just off the charts. He never looked back. You know, he That's just crazy. had the balls to say, to take what he learned and put it into action. And that's the way you were from the beginning. So I was desperate, man. I was desperate. I had been fired from every job I ever had. I'd been in my car wreck and could barely walk. And I was just like, it was... It was either it was either swim or sink, man. And I, I actually I feel bad for people sometimes who have like a spouse who can pay the bills because you need. I think you. I feel like you need that fire under your ass sometimes to actually get where you want to go. I remember you coming in, this tall guy wearing a cap, yeah. and I was like, "That's Chris. That's Chris. <laughs> really?" And it was like, "Okay," um, but it was the drive. Now, if people don't want to put in the time anymore, you know, yeah. they talk about the 10,000 hours. Yep. Heck, I think you probably put 2,000 in on that first letter. Um, a lot of time on that, yeah. You put a lot of time, but people don't want to do that. They want to like race through a letter, shovel some garbage over to a client, and then, okay, where can I get my next copywriting fix? It's not like that. If you talk to David Deutsch, David takes forever and two days to write a letter. Yeah. He told me that back in the day when he was writing for Boardroom with Brian Kurtz, Brian would call him on a Friday afternoon and say, David, the printer is running on Monday and we <laughs> do not have your letter because the printer had to be reserved and so yeah. forth. And David would have to finally hand the letter off over the weekend. The graphic, graphic designers would lay it off because it had to run on Monday. Yeah, yeah. Um, people like David, people like Chris um, really take their time to perfect it. And they're not going to push a product out the door until it's ready. Now, when, when you, talk to Chris about his products and, and stuff like that. There, Chris has built into his brain where he's going to go through his letter. He has the process mm -hmm. down. He knows yeah. what he's going to He even yeah. explicated it perfectly in, in pig, mm -hmm. step by step by step. So when he does it, he's going through the formula in it. But there's still the word and emotional choices that he goes through and polishes and repolishes until it's done. Most of the time, it's a home run because of the work that he's put in. And sometimes- Not, not always. I've had failures like anybody. We all do. Sometimes he has to redo them. Look, yep. um, everybody talks about Gary Bensavenga, but Gary, won face-offs in copywriting about like what was it 80 83 percent of the yep. time yep and the rest of the time he lost just like the rest of us 83 percent win is a pretty high <coughs> a pretty high record but they were like with baseball right it's like you get a point what, I, I don't follow baseball but you get like a 500 or something like that that's insane but you're still you're still striking out half the time at that right. point right and, like, and the biggest players i use this all the time when i would teach copy that uh, Babe Ruth and Mickey Mantle, two of the biggest home run hitters of all time, also were the biggest strikeout leaders. Yep. And if you're not willing to take a chance and swing the bat and strike out, you are never going to connect for that home run. Mm -hmm. And don't go for a single, man. This is the thing, too. Like, if you want extreme success, you can't try to hit a single or try to hit a bunt or whatever else. You got to go for it. And the way to go for it is you got to be creative. You have to be different. You have to have ideas. You have to have a mechanism. You have to have a big idea that hasn't been regurgitated over and over and over again. It's hard, but if you want to get like extreme success to the point that you're not worried about making your five grand this month, that's what you have to do. It's difficult. And one of the things is make sure 
whoever the hell it is, make sure that you have a mentor and make sure you have a mentor where you're not one in a crowd. The person knows your style. You could um, slip them a letter in the middle of the night and they would look at it and know exactly who wrote the letter and have feedback for you. you I, I know people like having big groups of stuff, but you don't get the attention that you need. You need a mentor who's gonna work with you on your thing. That's why when you had the pig and there was the mentoring program attached yep. to it, um, I was watching people. First of all, people took action on it. They did. And people started submitting stuff and yep. the stuff was getting better and better because mm -hmm. they had access. Yep. Make sure you have access to a mentor who doesn't speak English as his 14th language. Oh, man. Yeah. Make sure that you have access to a mentor um, who has been a successful copywriter. And not who, just by teaching copywriting or teaching marketing right. or whatever. And, else. and who has written for the big players. Yep. You know, if you had somebody who spent a week at Agora and they sent him home. <laughs> And by the way, I've seen it happen. You know, you yeah. go there with an ego and they're going to say, thank you very much for coming to Baltimore. Goodbye. Um, I, I say to this day, if I ever tried working for boardroom, I would fail miserably, miserably. It is not the kind of thing I like to write. I don't work under that kind of stricture. The idea of like having to go through that kind of rigor as far as a legal thing goes and things like that, it just would not work for me at all. Whereas for Mike Morgan or somebody, it's a perfect place to be. Yeah, Mike loves that. He's he's super happy doing it. He just keeps knocking out home runs after home runs job. Yeah. and getting hip replacement operations. Hope you're well, Mike, if you're watching this. Mike. Like he is, yeah. Back on the bike um, scene, back on the bike scene. Yeah. Back on the bike. Um, but, you know, get someone looking. That's the only way to get good. Now, yeah. Chris started with me. Um, he went to, I introduced him to John, yep. introduced him to David Garfinkel, yep. and he, he's since struck up friendships with many, many, many other people. And you really should learn from more than one person. I agree. Absolutely. And, you know, so I worked with, um, with John and I went to Dan Kennedy and, studied with Dan and Gary Halbert, um, Carl Galetti, um, many, many others. There was my J internship period of time. Um, I went in deep and I read and bought everything. You know, I was at Bensavenga's, uh, the Bensavenga yeah, I think 100. 100. Yeah. It was more than 100, but the name stuck. That was uh, the previous most expensive copywriting course before mine, just to go on. That was great. You beat him. You yeah. beat him. And well, great, um, yeah. with inflation, who knows? But it did well. Yeah. Right. But remember, he had the live and then he had the recordings. You didn't yeah. have the live. You were in COVID. I was indeed. There was no way to do that. So if you had that, it would have been even better. And by the way, if there was ever a Haddad live seminar, oh, it's people coming. would come. It will hopefully happen next year. We'll see what happens. But right now we're still in the process of getting a lot of a lot of things spinning properly as far as plates go. But hopefully in the next year we'll, or next year, two years, we'll do some. And, and what happened to the, the love affair with uh, lambs and sheep that was supposed to happen? Lambs and sheep? What? New Zealand. Oh, New Zealand. No, so we, uh, we had this, we had talked about moving to New Zealand. My wife is from there and America is turning into a flaming hellhole, as everybody can kind of agree. Uh, and Angie, you know, doesn't like all the guns and doesn't like all the racism and doesn't like all the sheer chaos of this place. So we talked about moving to New Zealand and then uh, she started to get better because she was really sick with her own thing. And she doesn't want to feel like she's running from America without really getting to experience it. And then from my point of view, you know, I mean, I'm only really working again now after being going through a lot of stuff for a long time. And I want to be able to go speak I want to be able to go to events and hang out with friends and go to masterminds and all that stuff and really build this business as well as uh, the other stuff I'm working on. And I just don't feel like I can do that from 9,000 miles away the same way. So plus we like our house. So we're, we'll probably, I, I feel like we are going to end up in New Zealand at some point, probably in, but, but when we retire and we might move to Canada at some point if things get really, really bad down here, but we'll see what happens next. Well, you got beautiful country up above where you are. We do. Yeah. You go up to Vancouver, Canada. Yeah. Um, and hell, you could live anywhere in the world as long as there's a high-speed internet. 
Yeah, high speed internet in an airport that's not two hours away. I'm pretty happy, generally speaking. Well, when well, you think about all these ESLs, you know, so um, I have a weird number of fans around the world that I've discovered. Like there's all these people in Brazil that follow me. There's people in Africa. There's people in Eastern Europe. And there's a lot of uh, e like English as a second language copywriters out there who are trying to get into it. Sometimes I see these people from Africa or wherever else. And I'm like, I can't even understand what you're saying here because it's your, you know, your English isn't that good. But you're trying to go out getting English language clients as a copywriter. How, do you, how did that happen? And what do you think about it? So actually, I had a funny thing happen is it was through Andy. Um, Andy told me about a, a certain person who was in a niche that she's looking at. And I looked at the letter and I went, and she said, I said, this, pers this person hired a copywriter. Yep. And the copywriter is not it, it's it's a decent letter but the person is not a native english speaker mm -hmm. and she goes well how can you find out who it is and i said well let's try this and i took the first paragraph of it and i went and i pasted it into copyscape yep. and it found the original author who had posted yep. the letter on her blog Yep, and she was and she was in Nigeria, and I remember um, tracking her down on Facebook and found that she was in Justin and Stefan's group. Yep, and without mentioning her name, I wrote, "Hey, um, you know, congratulations on having your letter done. It was a really good first attempt, but you made one thing you might want to pay attention to. Yeah, you were writing for a female. This is a woman." You yep. were writing for a female audience, but you wrote like a guy and not yep. like a woman. Yep. And I said, and it definitely lowered the response. But Can I just tell you the number one thing that makes me know when it's a guy writing for women? Can I tell you right now? It's, a, it's always there. And it's when the guy is writing for women or as a woman and says, just between us girls. Like I've never in my life heard an actual woman say just between us girls in that way. But guys, when they're writing for women, always do that because they don't understand women at all, as far as I can tell. Right. And so this wasn't even that close of a thing, but it was like guy stuff. And that's just not the way people talk. Nope. So what I would do in those days is I would. Um, turn on my computer. Let's see. Let's try this. And I haven't done this in a long time. But, and I hope that the sound picks it up. Mm -hmm. uh, I hope that the sound picks it up. But um, let's see. Come on. Come on. Get in there. I know we're gonna have some dead air here. Crazy. Oh, dead air? Well, we'll do that. We'll we'll do that. No, it's okay. I'll just I'll just hum that Kate Bush song. That's ladies and gentlemen, the premier business war room conference call. The action coefficient. So by that I mean we're not gonna deal with just profoundly stimulating or enlightening uh, observations or intelligence briefings. We're gonna then translate and connect that to action steps you in your business or your practice, no matter where you are, large or small, should immediately take. Uh, that was Jay Abraham. Oh, yeah, okay. And when I would write for Jay, I would sit with headphones in my ears, mm -hmm. listening to Jay speak. I would go, what kind of recordings can you send me? And they would like send boxes of stuff. And I would put it on and just sit there for hours listening to Jay. And I would... I called up John. I went, Do you ever notice that Jay speaks in triplicate? Yeah. <laughs> this is the most amazing. This is the most outstanding. This is, frankly, the most incredible experience of learning that any person can ever have. Nice. And as a matter of fact, by the time you reach the end of the seminar, you will be able to quantify your growth, um, multiply your profits and exponentially take your business to the next level. But that every sentence yeah. is in triplicate. 
Interesting. I'd never. And that's it. just the way Jay talks. So that when you want to write for Jay, you want to write so that the person you are writing for can show it to his family, and they go, "Wow, I didn't know that you can write." Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. That's so it's got to have that personality and that feel and that yeah, all of that kind of. And thing. you get it by immersing yourself. These days, everybody's doing. And the, as the ambulance sped away, carrying my wife. Yep. Same thing every time. Same thing every single time. And there's no voice. They're all, they're all. The no, nothing, nothing feels individual. Nothing. Again, even like, um, you know, I'm doing my FOMA formula course. And one of the objections people have about my launch and how I pulled my launch off and if it can be duplicated or use the same techniques is, what if I'm not Chris Haddad, which is a totally valid thing to have. Cause I did my launch. I already have a huge reputation. I have a big personality. And I say, listen, I did my launch using my personality, but you need to do yours using yours. You need to do your own, you need to, to take your own weirdness and vulnerability and whatever it is and turn yourself up to 11, like a pro wrestling character. And that's how, that's what you need to put into your copy, especially these days when so much is really personality-based marketing, like, because we have the internet these days and all the, all the, the influencers and all that other kind of crap. I would say that the thing that people don't talk about, I don't know if you've spoken on it, mm -hmm. about it yet is how important working on your mindset is to a Absolutely. I feel like there's a product I want to do at some point, maybe for not just for copywriters, but for marketers as well, which is like the copy. I think David might have used this term at one point, but David Deutsch, uh, like copy thinking, you know, thinking like a great copywriter. Because I feel like I feel like the word copywriter actually kind of sucks in certain ways because it pigeonholes you to a certain degree. It pigeonholes you as the person who is doing the typing. When to me, a great copywriter, it's not about the typing. It's about the thinking. It's about the ability to see hooks and see mechanisms and see, you know, different ways to put things together in a way that's actually intriguing and interesting. And even if you never write, being able Able to do that thinking part of it, I think is just so insanely valuable. Mm. It was so hard at the beginning when John Colton would yell, Harlan, there's no hook here. Harlan, yep. there's no hook here. Harlan, yep. there's no hook here. All right, John, what the hell is a hook? Mm -hmm. So he said, well, did you ever read the um, uh, one-legged golfer? Of course I read the one-legged golfer. I have it memorized. Exactly. Because that's a hook. And I said, okay, but I don't have a one-legged golfer in mind. He goes, but you have something. Find yep. it. Yep. And you got to dig. Really, you usually have to like. I remember when I was freelancing years ago. You have to dig it out of a client. So so often when I was freelancing, and I'd be doing my intake call with a new client, and they're just like, "Oh, this happened and that happened," and then they say something that you're like. They, they bury the lead all the time, right? Where they're like, oh, this happened, that happened. And then I was in Cambodia once and I was attacked by a boar and me and my wife had to run from a bunch of pygmies and blah, blah, blah. And that's how we found this thing. And I'm like, why didn't you tell me that two hours ago? But the client usually being so close to things has no idea what is actually interesting about their own story or about their product. Yeah, well, but, co but copywriters these days, don't really have that interviewing skill because they already know what they're going to do. It was yeah, like in Greek yeah. mythology, there was the Procrustean bed, where if you were too short, they were going to stretch you so that you fit the bed. And if you were too long, they were going to cut off your legs so you fit the bed. Oh my, but the bed you're, was the bed was the bed. Yeah. You're getting this style VSL, whether you like it or not, because mm -hmm. this is all I got. Now, if it seems that we're making a lot of fun of, of this, it's because it's so rampant. Yeah. Yeah. And you guys are killing the market. Well, they're killing the market and they're killing themselves. Like I say this on every, every time I, this comes up at all, I always say, like, I can't imagine if I had gone out 15 years ago, whatever it was, 16 years ago and charged 10, 15 grand for a letter and not delivered, I would not be doing this podcast right now. I promise you, I would not have gotten, you know, gotten to the point that I was making 350 grand as a freelancer or that I was making millions as a business owner or anything like that, because reputation is everything. And if you suck and charge a lot, like Harlan said before, everybody in this business talks to each other, everybody in whatever niche you're in talks to each other and your reputation is 100% the most valuable thing you can have in business, I think. You know which part of pig I like the most? Uh, which one? The escape hatch. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> I like the escape hatch because it goes back to something that I talked about with Chris yep. way back in the day, which was my policy was I did a letter for a client and I did a letter for me. Yep. 
a letter for a client, a letter for me. Mm-hmm. And those were the days of easy pickings in, in Google. And yeah. I would put these letters up and all different niches. I would write them in like a day or two, throw them up and watch the money come in. And on autopilot, I would put them up, set up my PPC campaign, walk away from it. And I was doing 18K a month with a bunch of different products. Yep. So like, if I didn't have any copywriting clients, who we cared? Fine. We were fine, yeah. yeah. It, I was talking to my students about that today. I'm like, listen, man, even just having $5,000 a month coming in that is yours, that you don't need to go to a client for, having like, even if it's semi-passive or whatever else, it changes everything about your career, about your ability to negotiate with people, about your, because you've got your, as John would say, your fuck you money, right? When you, which isn't like, I've got so much I never need to work again. It's I've got enough, I don't need you. I don't need this job that is being offered to me right now that I actually don't want to do. Plus, as I always say, if you want to get really good as a copywriter, you need to do your own offers. You know, the, 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 if you want to be a pretty good copywriter, fine, but you want to be like great, you need to go from being a copywriter to a marketer. And be able to see the entire ecosystem, the entire funnel, to understand exactly. how affiliates work. To, and you don't need to become a great media buyer or anything, but you need to know how that works. You need to know how all of the different. I became so much better at this when I did my first, when I did um, text your wife in the bed way back in the day, my very, very first offer. I got so much better as a copywriter and learned so much more about how to do this. Uh, and I always tell people, like, you know, if you work with me, I'm going to tell you, do the client work, but be working on your own stuff too, always, every single time. Because, because ultimately, at some point you're gonna get sick and tired of it and you want the money to keep coming in. And if you have a product out there, especially a product that is timeless, um, maybe maybe once in a while you'll have to refresh the letter or stuff like that. But- I had offers I created 10 years ago that do still do 100 to 150 grand a year just by themselves without me touching them for all that time. It's pretty cool. And so if you're watching this guys, if you and back when I was getting started, and when I didn't have client things, I would show them the client's letters that I had done. Yep. And they were just as good. They were really go, this is good. Yep. Um, that's how I knew my initial letters were good, is because I would send them to John, and John would say, when he liked the letter, he would say, um, anyway, you could get me a copy of this. <laughs> um, I remember I wrote about so, a poker bot software, mm-hmm. and that was probably my favorite letter. It was for a college age kid, and he had a poker bot. I wasn't even sure what a poker bot was. Yeah, sure. Um, so, without understanding what a poker bot was, I wrote a letter as a story. And three interesting things happened. First, I sent it to Carlton and Carlton goes, Harlan, can you get me the software? (laughs) That's always good. I showed it to Garfinkel and Garfinkel goes, hey, Harlan, can you get me a copy of the software? (laughs) And then I gave it to the client and the client um, runs the letter, makes $200,000 the first day Oh my God. At $200,000 the first day and calls me up and says, Harlan, my PayPal account got shut. I made too much money. They said, I can't market this product on PayPal. Mm -hmm. Um, and, And he's laughing hysterically. And I went, dude, if my product was shut down and I couldn't sell it anymore, I'd be upset. And he goes, no, why be upset? He goes, now I know that I can do it. I'll just hire you to do another letter for me. And I won't (laughs) do it for something as controversial. He comes back to me like two weeks later, you know, um, can you do a weight loss tea letter? (coughs) Okay. Sure. Um, That made him millions and millions of dollars. And I'm like, okay, well, let's get more of my letters up there. And so I did. So I I hope you charged him more for the second one. Oh, he was more than happy to pay for it after the first one. People were happy to pay you. I've had people try to bribe me before. I haven't even looked for that letter in such a long time. Mm. But that was, Mm. that was 
one of my favorite letters. Well, it's, uh, I think it's probably about time to, to wrap it up because we've gone for an hour and a half now and that's, that's typically about what we do. And I've got another call in a few minutes, but uh, well, anything else you want to say before we, before we close up for the day? Well, when Chris's um, thing about how to launch a product comes out, mm -hmm. I think you should get it because if it's like everything Chris has done, it's going to be explicit. He's not going to hold anything no, back and you can go through it and actually do what Chris does. And the other thing is, we still never circulated the modeling session of Chris. That's true, we haven't. Yeah, we'll, we'll so, make that a bonus for FOMO, maybe. That, I, that would be I cool. used that. I used, We wanted it to be a bonus, but we missed the mark on the mark a little bit. Yeah, gee. Yeah. But I modeled Chris Adan. And even if you don't understand modeling, listening to the way Chris thinks is really good. So grab that product as soon as it comes out. It's a strange brain to be in, but I'll give you a tour. You know, I remember back in the day, people would be, be like, I wish I could just be in your brain for a day. I'm like, no, you don't. You really don't. It's not that pleasant, but it is pretty interesting. So you know? I'm going to ask you a question, which sure. is the picture in back of you that is on the right. What is that? The yellow this picture? One or this one or the yellow one. You know, it's funny. Every single time I do a call, my buddy Mason was asking the same thing. Uh, it is this cool little piece of artwork I got years and years ago that has a little cartoon character under a tree with some other stuff, you know, um, I don't know, I just kind of like it. There was a third one. I had three of these that the one on the right is the same thing. And then uh, one of them mysteriously disappeared from my house years ago. I still have no idea who took it. Yeah. One day you're going to find him and that guy's going to pay. Well, you know me, Harlan, uh, you, you know how I act when people rip me off. You know what I do when people rip me off. Oh my God, don't piss Chris off. I've seen it oh. and it's not pretty. Chris, Chris takes all of his energy and all of his laser focus mm -hmm. and turns the laser beam from healing to burning and it burns right through you to the gut. Yep. Yep. Don't do it. Don't do it. It's a bad, I always tell people, I am a very nice person right up until you steal from me. And then I am not a nice person anymore. So please do not steal. Actually, if you steal from me or if you uh, hurt a friend of mine in some way, you can hurt me all you want. I don't care. I can take it. But if you do that, any, either of those two things, I will burn you to the ground and I won't even feel bad about it because, hey, what are you going to do? Um, cool. Anything you want to like pitch or any, anywhere some people can go to kind of learn more about you or just, whatever just else you're doing? Follow me on Facebook. Mm -hmm. you want to hire me, send me a message. You want to learn about groups, reach out to me. That's all. I'm just doing my thing right now. Oh, one more question. Actually, I forgot to ask. What was it like for you watching me go from being a copywriter to the whole relationship advice, Michael Fiore stuff? What was, what was oh, that? You like? have no, I, first of all, number one yeah. is um, I have always been raised on the idea as an educator that my greatest satisfaction is seeing someone take your teachings and apply them. Yeah. Totally. So I have students, I mean, I have students who, former students who are famous lawyers. I have students yep. who have gone into politics and government and are on TV. I had a student was incidentally my weakest student ever, weakest IQ didn't probably didn't go into the third digit who, <laughs> who now listen to this part, ran a nine figure company. Holy crap. And, um, and I see that and I go, yeah, yep. I I'm just get this tremendous satisfaction at watching someone do this, this immense pride and go, I remember when. Yep. And I just say, that's fantastic. That's, that gives me such a feeling to go on and keep doing what I'm doing. So when I see a Chris Haddad hit the top, sell out on pig, and mm -hmm. I'm going, yeah, I remember spikes of doom. Yeah. It just makes me feel really good. So that's why I'm like always here. There's never been a time that you reached out and um, I, and I, sorry, I'm too busy, whatever. Because seeing you go to the next level just makes me feel really good. It's a wonderful, you know, now that I'm teaching and I have students, like my, uh, my student Moni, who's wonderful, she spoke at a big thing in Mexico with like 2000 people. She got up on stage and gave a copywriting speech. And I was just like, 
I was prouder of her than I would be of me and doing that kind of thing. It just felt so good seeing her start getting to that next level and get the, the esteem that comes from it. And be more importantly to me, it was like seeing her realize she knows what she's talking about, right? That she and really by the way, it. for people who are in this situation, if it bothers you that your student succeeds you, check your ego, really Absolutely. check your ego. Absolutely. Do some Absolutely. Zen, do some meditation. You should be happy for their success. Absolutely. That's um, what it's all about. I think so. And also just, I also, I think it's just part of getting older too. I'm in my forties now. And there's that part of just like, you get a little older and you kind of want to pass things on. You want to help other people more than you want to help yourself. I feel like, unless you, I don't know, unless you're really selfish or something. Um, anyway, thanks, Harlan. Thank you so much for coming on. And, and by sure the way, I just want, my last thing is, yeah, go for it. I just, I just want to point out that Chris and I took a lot of time to color coordinate today. So we really did. Yes. I we hope did. you are going to remember this podcast as the one where they really took the time to color coordinate. Exactly, because we are wearing the exact, for people that are just listening, we're wearing the exact same color shirt. Okay, for folks who are listening, uh, please, I would love to hear your thoughts on the episode. So shoot me an email at chris at the chrishadadshow.com. Please go over to iTunes and Spotify. Leave some stars, leave some reviews. We can always use more of those. And uh, tune in next week. Wait, I don't know who's actually, I, next week's gonna be John Rowley. Our friend John Rowley is actually next week. And it's gonna be a good one. I love that guy. So that's gonna be it. Bye-bye. The recording is stopping now.